beloved people of God, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Creator and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is truly a joy to welcome you here to Parkwood on this beautiful Palm Sunday. Um, first things first, a thank you to Congregational Life for a wonderful, wonderful breakfast this morning. Um, and to all of you for bringing such delicious food. Please excuse me if I pass out from a food coma. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
so much to eat, it's so good, it's very tempting. With that in mind, next week is going to be typically the time we collect for the one great dollar sharing. In your bulletin, you will find this little insert. I would encourage you to read it and look at the pictures. This insert has um, a lot of the information about the one great dollar share. But I would like to encourage you to go beyond looking at the brochure, the insert, and I would like you to think of concepts. This insert has several concepts in it. When you read it, please think of restoring, improving, and repairing. That's what this offering is all about. Restoring, improving, and repairing. If you don't have an envelope in your packet, there are envelopes in the seat back. I encourage you to give generously. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Okay. Anything else? Any other announcements, reminders, things that I missed? All right. Then with all of that said, let us worship God together. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. We will sing to the Lord a new song and sing God's praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of God rejoice in their king. Let them praise God's name with dancing, making melody with tambourine and lyre. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with God calls us together in worship and in grace. Please join us in hymn 197, Hosanna, loud, Hosanna.
As we offer our prayers of confession, remember that God chooses to forget about our past, forgiving us so we may embrace the new life and new hope offered to us in grace. I invite you to join me as we pray together. God, God of new things, we would rather than ourselves in, surround ourselves with the people like us, than follow you into new relationships and new ways of living.
for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today we wrap up our Lenten sermon series where we've heard the stories of faithful people. So as we wrap up, I want to take a moment to explain a little bit the relationship between scripture and these stories. You may have noticed that we haven't spent a ton of time over the last several weeks mining the depths of these scripture passages, but instead focus mostly on the life and faith of the person that we've been hearing about. The idea here is not so much that scripture doesn't require explanation, but instead that we can hold up this piece of scripture and say, what might it look like if we centered our everyday lives around this story, this word from the Lord, this witness to Jesus Christ? Today's story, initially at least, might not seem like it has anything to do with the person that we're talking about. But hang in there, it'll make sense later, I promise. This is the story of Jesus' final triumphal entrance into Jerusalem, where he mocks the military victory parades of the day by riding in on a colt instead of a war horse, with cloaks spread on the road instead of a red purse. This is Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a theologian, a member of the German resistance. He was an academic, a teacher, a pastor, but what I want to focus on today is that Bonhoeffer was a man of many questions. He was born into a large family in 1906. His father was a prominent psychiatrist, which meant that the family was well off, well connected, and not particularly religious. They lived very comfortably among Germany's elite in Berlin. The children were each baptized and confirmed within the German Protestant Church, but only Dietrich ever really took an interest in spiritual things. When Germany plunged into World War I, their lives changed very little, with one exception. Dietrich's oldest brothers volunteered for the German army. Both of them were sent to the Western Front, and one of them was killed in action. Not long after that, Dietrich surprised his family when, at age 13, he decided that he wanted to study theology and become a theologian. His oldest siblings and his father thought this was an absolute waste of time and energy. 
but it was ultimately a distraction from the real world and the real work of promoting equality and human rights. Charles Marsh, one of Bonhoeffer's biographers, captures this conversation. Look at the church, they insisted, a more paltry institution one can hardly imagine. Unmoved, Dietrich replied, in that case, I shall reform it. None of them were wrong. Bonhoeffer completed his high school studies at age 17, then spent a year studying theology at the University of Tübingen. After a few months traveling in Italy, he returned home and began a doctoral program in theology at the University of Berlin. This was normal for the German education system. There he studied under some of the greatest Protestant theologians of the era. But here's the interesting thing about German academic theology in the early 20th century. It was completely dedicated to the philosophical and theoretical study of doctrine. There was very little concern in this academy about ethics or the influence of the church on everyday life or even things like prayer. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who arrived in 1924 at the age of was increasingly interested in and dedicated to the idea of Christian community, of a sense of shared life and purpose centered in Jesus Christ. His professors were a little bewildered, but impressed. At age 21, he completed and defended his dissertation titled Sanctorum Communio, or Holy Commun Community. His main question was remarkable in its simplicity. Where, within the reality of the world, does the new life confessed by Christians become real? Bonhoeffer longed for a more concrete, more dynamic, more embodied and vital faith. Oddly enough, though, even while he was writing about the lived experience of Christian community, he rarely attended church services himself and had no particular home congregation. After his doctorate was finished, he needed a job, as do most of us, and he was still too young to be ordained as a minister. Instead, the local bishop sent him to Barcelona, Spain for a year to spend the year as an assistant pastor, ministering to the growing German expat population. While he was there, he worked in a parish with more than 700 members, but usually no more than 40 in attendance on any given Sunday. This experience drove home a question that persists even today, 70 plus years later. Can Christianity really become a vital force for good in the world and a source of meaning? in the lives of people who have found better ways to spend a Sunday morning. He returned to Berlin after that and began writing his second dissertation. And after receiving his second doctorate, the university hired him as a teaching assistant, which left him restless and unfulfilled. So when he was offered a year-long postdoc fellowship at Union Theological Seminary in New York, he very quickly accepted. He finished the requirements for ordination that summer and set sail for New York City in 1930. He didn't know it yet, but for him, this year would change everything. Upon arrival, Bonhoeffer was decidedly unimpressed with American Protestant Christianity, which he described in his journal as sloppy theology. Ouch. <laughs> He did, however, quite enjoy his coursework with Reinhold Niebuhr, who introduced Dietrich to Christian realism, which is a theological framework focused on the real lived experience of actual people and how they live in a broken and divided world. But it was more his experiences outside the classroom that formed him. At the December break, Dietrich traveled to Cuba to preach for a German community there, which required him to travel by train all the way down the East Coast and catch a boat in Florida. 
For the first time in his very privileged life, he witnessed outright discrimination firsthand as he traveled through the southern United States ruled by Jim Crow laws. This thoroughly confused him, and his questions about Christianity and daily life became much more urgent and concrete. He wrote, how does one understand the spiritual character of a nation that has so inordinately many slogans about brotherhood, peace, and so on, but at the same time legislates and practices racial segregation? When he returned to New York, an African-American seminarian by the name of Franklin Fisher sought him out and invited him to, at to attend worship at his church, Abyssinian Baptist Church. Abyssinian was a black church in Harlem, which was then in the middle of the Harlem Renaissance. From his first visit, Bonhoeffer was drawn to this place. The enthusiastic preaching, the unbridled joy, and yet the seriousness and depth. This was precisely what he had been seeking in a holy community. He would remain at Abyssinian for the rest of his time in the United States. The pastor and the congregation coming to love and embrace this random German guy in a suit and silk tie. He taught a Sunday school class for boys and a Wednesday women's Bible study. He helped with youth outings and musical events, and he was even invited to preach on one occasion. As a musician himself, he fell particularly in love with the music. He took home several recordings of spirituals, which would sustain him in the dark days to come. By the time Bonhoeffer returned to Germany, he was changed, and he began to search the Christian and the Jewish traditions for inspiration toward dissent, civil courage, and peacemaking. For the next few years, he worked two part-time jobs, as an unpaid lecturer at Berlin University and as a campus pastor at a technical college nearby. He struggled with both. By the time Hitler and the Nazi party came to power in 1933, his lectures were some of the most popular and well-attended at the university but each of them flew directly in the face of this new wave of German supremacy. Bonhoeffer was already, in 1930, in hot and dangerous waters. The German Protestant church, following the political agenda of the age, began to imagine a church based not on common belief or spiritual unity, but blood a unity based on Aryan ethnic uniformity. Church officials also began to describe Hitler as the German savior who would lead Germany to take its rightful place as God's chosen people. The first major flashpoint between Bonhoeffer and church officials came in the form of what's now called the Aryan paragraph, which was an amendment to the church law that absolutely forbade anyone with any Jewish ancestry from receiving the sacraments. This meant that all Jewish converts to Christianity, and even those whose parents were converts, were barred from church marriages, receiving communion, holding leadership positions, and in some cases, even just attending worship services. Bonhoeffer was horrified at the very idea and encouraged his fellow ministers and church leaders to reject it outright. But, because German churches were increasingly entangled with and partially accountable to the government, the Nazis won and a rule was instituted. Many other battles like this one would follow, unfortunately with the same result. Eventually, a group of resistors came together. With Bonhoeffer and several other prominent ministers at the helm, they formed information networks, they made international ecumenical contacts, and they spoke out, though somewhat timidly, against the abuses of Jews by the government, the people, and the church. Bonhoeffer saw the Reich Church movement as more than a few bad actors and encouraged his fellow dissenters to treat this moment as a status confessionis, 
a crisis that required the church to speak decisively with a new confession of faith. This idea got very little support early on, and out of frustration, Bonhoeffer decided to take a two-year post as a minister in London. While he was there, the Confessing Church, as the dissenting movement would be called, created what's called the Theological Declaration of Barman, also known as the Barman Declaration. This confession, which is now part of our Book of Confessions in the PCUSA, reminds us that our Christian faith rests on the shoulders of Judaism, and that Jesus Christ alone is the head of the church. No politician or political party, no person or movement, no theologian even, can usurp Jesus' centrality and authority. In essence, it was meant to say, if Jesus is Lord, then Hitler is not. When he returned from London, Bonhoeffer rejoined the dissenting church movement. And he imagined and created a seminary, training a group of new ministers who would have the theological and moral clarity to fight the new Reich Church and win the hearts and minds of the German people once again. Meanwhile, the government was busy shutting down free speech and free worship, attempting to ban every form of worship or preaching outside of the official Reich Church. Bonhoeffer was specifically prohibited from lecturing or preaching in public. He was banned from the city of Berlin, and his writings were all banned. By the time he established this seminary for the Confessing Church, in 1935, at Fickenwald in rural northwest Germany, literally everything he was doing was illegal. Finkenwald started with just Bonhoeffer as the sole professor for 27 students. To their annoyance, their professor was out to do more with them than teach the foundations of Christian theology and German philosophy. He taught them to study scripture, not just for doctrine's sake, but as a source of guidance for their own lives. He taught them spiritual disciplines and how to pray for one another. He lectured on the responsibilities of the church to the world, and their own responsibility as theologians to serve the church with integrity and passion. Out of this two-year experiment would come his most well-known book to this day, called The Cost of Discipleship. When the Gestapo finally shut down the seminary in late 1937, Bonhoeffer and his best friend slash student, Eberhard Bethke, were away on vacation. But most of the rest of his students and staff were arrested. Bonhoeffer laid low for a while, teaching to small groups of confessing church seminarians. Eventually, he was found out and shut down once again, and this was when he made his first contacts with the German political resistance in 1938. At this point, Dietrich's brothers were working for the German government and also as double agents for the resistance. They would eventually recruit him to help avoid being drafted, and he went to work directly for a military intelligence agency. He was supposedly using his overseas ecumenical contacts to gather information, but he was also working as a double agent, feeding information to the Allies. By the early 1940s, Dietrich and others became increasingly convinced that the only way to end the atrocities in Germany was to assassinate Adolf Hitler. A decade earlier, he had proposed a three-pronged approach to resistance. He said the church should question the legitimately le legitimacy of the state's actions. The church should assist the victims of such action, even if they do not belong to the Christian community. And the church should take direct political action of its own, not just to bandage the victims crushed by the wheel, but to break the spokes of the wheel if necessary. He tried the first two, 
protesting and teaching, even helping Jewish families cross the border into Switzerland. And now it was time to break the machine itself. Bonhoeffer thus became the pastor to the resistance, offering prayer, teaching, and the sacraments to those who would commit murder, high treason, and all sorts of other crimes. He wrestled personally and theologically with what he was doing, but ultimately decided that this was a no-win situation. Whether he stood silently by and did nothing and allowed these atrocities to continue, or whether he actively helped commit both outright sins and crimes against the state, he would still find himself a sinner. So he took Martin Luther's advice to sin boldly and depended daily on the promise of Christ's grace and mercy. Fortunately and unfortunately, Bonhoeffer would be arrested before any concrete plans for an assassination could take shape. In April 1943, he was accused of avoiding the draft, which he did, and participating in subversive activities by publishing at least two books without state approval. He was taken to a Gestapo prison in Berlin. In the year and a half he spent at Tegel, he would be interrogated, tortured, and interrogated some more. Still, he wrote on the meaning of suffering and he dreamed up new theological projects in his letters. On July 20th, 1944, an attempt was made on Hitler's life, an unsuccessful coup that resulted in the arrest and execution of Bonhoeffer's brother and two brothers-in-law. That fall, Dietrich would be removed from prison and sent first to the Buchenwald camp and finally to the Flossenburg. When the investigation eventually turned up his connection to the plot in 1945, he was quickly tried by a single general, found guilty, and executed on April 9th. His final resting place is a mass grave somewhere just outside of Flossenburg. The camp was liberated by Allied forces exactly two weeks later. <clears throat> Overall, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was immensely complex. He loved the idea of the church, but he struggled to love its lived reality. He believed strongly in Christ's care for the poor and the defenseless, and he lived pretty lavishly himself. He was the stereotype of an aloof academic, but his heart came to life when he preached and taught, especially with youth and children, whom he loved dearly. He was a committed pacifist, but was willing to aid violence for the sake of ending atrocities. Even amidst all of these contradictions and questions, all of his theological writing and activism came down to a single set of questions, which he wrestled with every day. What would God have me do on this day in this place? How can I bring the resurrection of Christ to bear on this moment? Those questions often made him a threat to those who wanted to hold on to their own power. In his own time and place, the answers led him down dangerous paths, and ultimately, led him to his own death. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer embodied for us the wrestling that each of us is called to in our time and our place as followers of Jesus. In the end, he would not and could not be silent in the face of atrocity, because even if he had tried to close his heart, to do nothing, to isolate himself in the theoretical, he knew that the stones and the streets themselves would have cried out, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. I'll now invite us to rise as you're able for our next hymn.
With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. So send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless might indeed be to us our communion in the body and blood of Christ. Grant that, being joined together in him, we might attain to the unity of our faith and grow up in all things into Christ Jesus, our Lord. Just as these grains have been gathered from many hills into one land, and these grapes from many places into one cup, grant, O oh Lord, that your whole church might soon be gathered from the ends of the earth, into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. On the same night that he was betrayed, Jesus sat at table with his disciples. There, he took bread, blessed God for it, and broke it. He gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. After they had eaten, he took the cup, blessed God for it, and poured it out, saying, This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood. As often as you do this, remember me. This is not my table, not a Presbyterian table, not Parkwood's table. This is Christ's table. And precisely because of that, absolutely everyone is welcome. So please participate as you feel most comfortable today. A word of instruction. In a moment, the ushers uh, will dismiss folks from the back by rows. We'll invite you to come down the center aisle, receive a piece of bread from me in the middle. Then you can go to either side where the servers will place a cup on the table. Please take that, drink it, and leave the cup in the basket on the end. If you can't come forward, then Bard will come to you. I'll invite the servers forward. All things are now ready.
Let us pray. God of grace, we thank you and praise you for the ways that you nourish us, the ways that you challenge us, the ways that you call us into new life in very real and concrete ways. As we head into this Holy Week, we pray that you would give us more and more examples of ways that we can be examples of your new life in our midst. It's in Christ's name that we pray. to the offering and our God and our God in love has done great things for us made a way through our brokenness loosened our grip on fear cradled us in grace now let us take hold of that grace as we give from what we have received
We also um, got a note from Elaine Dumler. Her husband, Ron, is also receiving hospice care. Um, and she got a call over the weekend that um, they are looking towards the end of his life probably in the next couple of days. So we will pray for Elaine and for their family and Ron um, in this season. Also a note from um, Betty Hedworth. Her son had surgery this week. We prayed for him last week. That went well. Um, he's healing and doing well. He had a hip replaced um, and he is getting around great with his walker. Thanks be to God for that. How else can we pray today? Doug. For the people of Covenant Presbyterian Church and School in Nashville. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Any others? Ms. Storm Nicholas. Yes. Um, all those affected by tornadoes and storms around the country. Um, Be to God that David is healing and with us and um, able to do most of what he wants to do. BJ. In case you didn't hear it on the news, the lodge was struck by lightning. Uh, there were no damages as far as we know at this point. Nobody was hurt, but it was scary. Wow. Um, yeah, I did not know that. Um, so the lodge at American House, where many of our members and friends live, um, was struck by lightning in the storms this weekend. So um, thankfully there are no um, evident damages and no one was hurt, but it is very much a scary thing. I'd like to, excuse me, I'd like to add to that the first responders. They all came out. We even had fire trucks from Granville and also Jacksonville. There was over nine emergency vehicles there. Wow. Absolutely. Um, so after the lightning strike, they had um, nine emergency vehicles from all over the area come and check everything out, make sure everything and everybody was okay. And so thanks be to God for them. And we will pray for their um, safety and their work. for Becky, right? Yeah. Awesome. Um, we will absolutely pray for her. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Let's go to God in prayer together. God of grace, we come to you with so much weighing on our hearts. So many worries and um, questions and anticipation. God, we pray for all those who are sick and recovering. Um, we praise you for the healing we see among us. We praise you for Betty's son and that his surgery went well. Uh, for David, for all those at the lodge who are okay after this lightning strike. Um, we pray that you would continue to grant each of them well-being and healing. We pray too for those who are dying and those who love them. We pray for Ron and Elaine and their family as they say goodbye um, and as they grieve um, his coming loss. We pray to you for Vern, for his family, um, and we pray that you would grant them your peace and rest and comfort. We also pray for all those who have experienced trauma and disasters. Um, we pray for Covenant Church and school 
um, as they continue to reel from the shooting there this week. God, we pray for them as they grieve these unimaginable losses. We pray to you for the city of Nashville, that you would grant them your love and support in these coming days and weeks and months and years. We pray to you for all those who were affected by tornadoes and storms this weekend. Um, we pray for those who have lost homes and vehicles and jobs and loved ones. God, we pray that you would surround them with a community of love and support to help them weather these next uh, few weeks and months and help them rebuild. Lord, we pray that all of these people would know that they are not alone. We pray to you for Becky. You know exactly what she needs, Lord, and we pray that you would give that to her um, and that you would surround her with love. And now, as our hearts begin to turn to whatever awaits us this week, we lift our hearts and our voices together in the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts.
Christ's love, you seek to grow in love for God and your neighbor. This love is the work of our hearts to care and be cared for. Of our souls to know and be known. Of our minds to learn and to teach. And our strength to do justice and so on. Friends, as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face to you and give you peace. Amen.